live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering AWS Summit 2017. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Hi, welcome back to theCUBE. We are live in San Francisco at the AWS Summit. We've had a great uh, day so far. I'm Lisa Martin with Jeff Frick and we're really excited to be joined next by ThingLogix. Carl Krupitzer from ThingLogix, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Tell us all about in a, uh, ThingLogix, what do you guys do um, and how do you work with AWS? Sure, so we're a, um, an IoT platform and solutions company, so we've actually um, help customers design, develop, and deploy uh, and bring to market IOT solutions and you know, connected products. How long have you been, and tell us a little bit about your history. There's an Amazon tie-in that kind of predates ThingLogix. Give right. us a little bit of insight about that. So we were actually the services and solutions group with inside, inside of a company called Telemetry, um, and that was eventually purchased by Amazon and became the AWS IOT platform. So our DNA of our company goes back to the very beginnings of what is now the AWS IOT service. Excellent, and so you were founded in 2014? 2014, we spun out from, uh, from telemetry, and we did so because we were working with a few big customers um, that really, we saw an opportunity to help companies really kind of figure out what to do with IoT and accelerate their adoption of, of IoT inside of the enterprise. So there's a consulting arm as well as, as a technology. Right, right, so we have, we have our uh, professional services and our advisory services group um, that works with customers really to get them through the idea phase. Um, and then we offer a, a technology platform that is um, ThingLogix Foundry, that really is a platform that sits on top of all the underlying AWS serverless compute resources. So IoT is a big space, GE's in it, everybody's in it. You're a little company. Yeah. So what's, what's interesting is both from an entrepreneurial point of view, um, as well as just you know, punching above your weight, how does working kind of in the, in the AWS ecosystem, both as for your own infrastructure, but also as for go to market and partnership, you know, enable you guys to, to really do punch above your weight? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge when you start getting into a, a partner ecosystem like AWS. Um, what, the thing that sets us apart, really, is that we are very much a pure play serverless computing company. From the ground up, we've built our own infrastructure that way, we've built our own platform that way. Um, and it allows us to be a lot more agile and creative with our customers. Um, it allows us to move much faster and more cost effectively than a lot of other system integrators. Would right. Be. And you said, you said before we turned on the cameras that too, it also though gives you these partnership opportunities with less pure plays. Correct. Um, to insert you into potentially a bigger project for that piece that you guys could deliver better than anybody else. So that's a pretty unique opportunity. Right, yeah. It's, so us partnering with some of the bigger systems integrators um, is pretty standard practice for us because we can come in and we can work with the business on really prototyping and innovating quickly. Um, get us, you know, getting the rapid application development side of things done, and then transition that over to the more managed services oriented firms to right. take on the support. And can you imagine trying to do what you're doing without <laughs> a big infrastructure <laughs> provider, a big marketplace partner? No, no, it would be, it would be nearly impossible. Um, just to, you know, IoT is a, a fast moving um, technology trend. I mean, it's been around for a while in the M to M space. Right. Um, and typically it's been controlled by the engineering side of the house. Um, what we're seeing now is that it's migrating more over to the product management and marketing folks. So they're expecting the same agility that you get with platforms like Salesforce, platforms like Workday. They want that same thing in their product development life cycle. So you know, we've been able to help customers take projects from concept and prototype through to actually you know, in stores, in the market, in about nine to nine weeks, nine to 12 weeks. Wow. So. So I was just thinking, uh, as you guys were, were chatting, about what, what the consulting services are like. like where, where, give us an example of a typical customer, you, you kind of just did, where they, are you talking to retailers that have IoT products to sell? You mentioned kind of more of a, of a buying center maybe within products and marketing. So I was just right. wondering kind of what is, that what is that typical customer like? And, what sort of sub questions do they come to you with? Is it more of an idea that we need to get to market? Or is it more of a, we have all of these devices at the edge that we need to 
So it's it's a combination, right? I mean, okay. we've we deal a lot with consumer product companies that are trying to you know enable or you know connect an existing product or an existing line of products. Um, and they're doing so not for the engineering purposes, but more to you know, in get a better customer experience and a more timely customer experience, right? Um, being able to connect with their customers in, in new and different ways. We're also seeing quite a bit of um, migration from legacy systems like Exata or in-house solutions to the AWS cloud. Really this, um, this idea of cloud first architecture um, has taken root in the enterprise, and it's, it's been happening over the last 10 years, and I think it's really starting to pay off because companies are looking for a reason not to go to the cloud versus a reason to go to the cloud. In IoT, with the AWS platform and the serverless compute resources, really it takes away all those, those reasons why you would. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to oh. stop. <laughs> They're we'll talking we'll to us. A, the, a, big, uh, the big voice from above, right? <laughs> pause for an announcement. <laughs> Get a t-shirt. Oh, a t-shirt. Get a t-shirt. I don't want to miss out on that. Um, so, just wanted to ask you, give us some ideas of how customers are using the service. As I was looking at your webpage, I'll open it back up, and uh, as a pool owner, I thought, oh, pool energy, I think I, I, think I need that. Right. Give us an idea of a, of a company like that. Was this an idea that has really been enabled by what you provide? Sure, so we've seen companies really try to evolve um, some of their products, some of their commodity products into more of a, a smart service, right? Um, when, when AWS IoT launched, we led with a company called Sealed Air, and they were actually investigating, they make commodity chemicals and um, cleaning equipment and things like that, and they were looking for new and different ways to really add value to their products. So we came out, helped them prototype and come out with a connected hand soap dispenser, which seemed kind of silly at the time, but when you start looking at the secondary uses of the data, um, it allowed them to really start to hone in on hand sanitation compliance um, and really kind of start to wrap a reduction of foodborne illness around this one connected device. And as we started to extend that, you know, the, we started to get into auto replenishment, we started to get into consumption billing, so they can actually, you know, companies can now take a piece of equipment, um, put it out to a customer with less capital investment and charge per hour of use or per thing that happens on that machine, right? So we're seeing a lot of evolution of business models, people trying to do different things, um, and it comes down usually to make money or save money, right? right, and right. Companies that want to make money are, are going down a path of really that enhanced customer experience. Companies that want to save money are really looking for efficiencies in field service and warranty claims and in you know, waste reduction. Right. I'm curious though on kind of the secondary value of the data. Right. Was that something they they had kind of thought about ahead of time that maybe we'll be able to get, or no, was no. it something that kind of came along? Because because clearly yeah. auto replenishment, right? That's that's easy, right. and and billing by consumption, okay, that that that's not brain surgery, but it's the secondary stuff that 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 really becomes the essence of digitizing your business. And I right. think the hand sanitizer is a really interesting example because who would ever think there's a digital play beyond the obvious in hand sanitation? Right, right. And it, it, what it allows them to do is focus in on behaviors of people that you could never measure otherwise, right? right. It would be very difficult to sit in a deli all day long and watch whether or not every employee washes their hands the correct amount of time but we can really easily take a look across an entire supermarket chain and pick out who the outliers are and then focus the efforts on training those individuals and, and really enhancing the, the compliance of that. Because was it pick facility. up their ID tag when they're, when they're in proximity to the uh, hand sanitizer? Well, so there are a lot of privacy concerns that right, we, we right. do, so we more take a look at the aggregate of the, the okay. data and just say that one is completely out of band from the others. Right, right, that's great. So. That's, that's amazing, yeah. you again wouldn't really think of that, but to your point, that does really kind of underscore just one of the important elements that di businesses need to consider when digitizing. It's new business opportunities, new revenue streams, cost optimization, and that is a, a really kind of a, I don't know, maybe it's not a unique example, the, the hand sanitizer example, of, of the other elements in which that business was able to get into by having this uh, secondary look, at, or maybe a completely different look at the data. Yeah, and it's, you know, as IoT really starts to serve those other masters besides the engineering and um, R&D folks, the marketing people are asking completely different questions than the technology people have been asking, which is why we're being pressured to move so quickly, because as the creativity starts to enter into this technology trend, they're expecting results immediately versus right. having to wait nine months and 
spend millions of dollars. It, it was interesting in Andy's um, fireside chat, buzzword bingo, he said the buzzword that's delivering on its promise the fastest, in his opinion, was IoT. Yeah. I, 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 was, I, I was totally caught by surprise of all the different things. I would never have guessed that he would pick IoT, but you're right at the leading edge of this stuff, and it's, it's moving faster than probably you know, people give it credit for. The, the, the tough part about IoT is it's so huge, right? There's so right. many different flavors of it. GE has the industrial IoT that they're chasing after. You know, the consumer products tends to be, you know, right now it's a trend to connect everything from toothbrushes to, to whatever, right? But the, the idea being that, you know, having this connected product can either enable new customer experiences, drive new business models, or help drive efficiencies in an organization is really the fulfillment of that promise. All right. From a cultural perspective, I'm just curious, you're, you're small right now. One of the things too that Andy talked about that I thought was interesting was he was starting to talk about the culture of, of AWS. One of the things that they've been very vocal about is they're very customer centric. They mm -hmm. rarely talk about competition. How, how is that being a partner and being in the marketplace with one of the announcements today that's making it even simpler? Do you feel that as a partner with them that being in this marketplace, is, does their culture kind of permeate through that and help you open doors, like we talked about a minute ago, with other partners? Oh, they're, fin they're fantastic. It's a great partner program just because um, they're super collaborative with even small partners like us. I mean, you know, we had maybe a, a little bit different experience coming into Amazon because we came with a little bit of knowledge of what they were already dealing with, but um, no, I, I, they've been really responsive and helpful and um, it's, it, being in the marketplace is going to change the game for us because it offloads a lot of the things that we don't want to do as we make the move more toward providing a platform as a service. Um, you know, they will take over the billing and the distribution and the management of the end customer more so than a small company like us would be able to do. So right. I think it enables a small company to get a br greater reach than it would for, you know, it, normal, right? normally distributed. Excellent, well Carl, thank you so much thank for joining you. us on theCUBE today and sharing with our audience a little bit about ThingLogix. We wish you continued success. Thank you. And uh, connecting more and more and more devices globally. Thank you. For my co-host Jeff Frick, I'm Lisa Martin. You've been watching us live on theCUBE at AWS Summit San Francisco. Stick around, we'll be right back.